from 1 Kings 19. You know, we saw last week a great showdown on Mount Carmel. Where well, the Lord used Elijah in a great display of power to put the false prophets to, to death. After this occurred, Ahab ran back to his evil wife Jezebel, who has been hunting down and killing the prophets, and told her what had happened on Mount Carmel. In her rage, she sent a messenger to tell Elijah this. He says, if, if, if tomorrow, by tomorrow, you not dead, may my gods kill me. This shook Elijah, and he panicked, took off running for his life. He ran all the way to Judah. There, there he left his servant, kept on running all the way, a whole day's journey into the desert. Came to a tree, sat down, mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, spiritually spent. And he prayed to God. He said, God, I'm done. I, I, I can't take it anymore. I've had enough. Just take my life now. I just want to die. I, I, I'm no better than my forefathers. I'm just at the end and I'm done. And in the midst of this prayer, he's so exhausted, he fell asleep. Slept for like two days. And during that time of him sleeping, God sent an angel to take care of him, gave him food and water and direction. Then he traveled 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. That's the same mountain we remember Moses was on where he had some fellowship with God. Elijah went into a cave and he spent the night. And during the time he was in the cave, a word came to Elijah that says, Elijah, what you doing here? God, God I've been faithful to, to you. I've been on fire for you. And you know, your people have rejected the covenant. They, they tore up all of your altars and killed your prophets. I'm the only one left and they trying to kill me too. The Lord told him to go stand atop the mountain for my presence is about to pass. And after the wind, earthquake, and the fire, there was a gentle whisper to Elijah. Elijah went out to the mouth of the cave. And the voice says, I'm going to ask you again. Elijah, why are you here? Well, I, as I said before, God, I've been on fire for you. Your people. They ain't doing right. Tore, tore down your altars. They rejecting your covenant. They trying to kill everybody. And they after me. The Lord says, I hear you. Get up. Go back the way you came. You need to anoint two kings. You need to choose your successor. Anoint him too. And uh, by the way, you're not the only one left. There, there are 7,000 who have not bowed down to false gods waiting there for you. So get going. When doing this sermon, I, I read, reread the scripture and I looked for what, what is needed to extract from this account for us. Then I looked from, from, from last week to this week, what is happening. The Lord gave me this topic of dealing with depression. Dealing with depression. Let me first say that depression is a real thing. It's not made up. And it's not just exclusive to non-believers, as we will see. Almost everyone at some point in time is going to deal with some form of depression from minor to acute clinical. But unfortunately, many will never admit it. Many will never seek help. Many will try to self-medicate, and we know how that usually 
turns out. Disaster for the person and the people around them. But, but prayerfully, if you've been paying attention to sermons over the past months and years, you know that it, it, you know better than to fight alone. That God has brought you to this faith community that there will be groups of us fighting with and for one another. There are so many antidepressant medications on the market that they write in tens of millions of prescriptions every year. About eight to ten billion dollars worth of revenue just on antidepressant medication alone. I see advertisements and they go like this. You have a depressed mood, loss of sleep, loss of interest. Do you have difficulty concentrating, easily agitated? Are you restless? It goes on to say that you may have a chemical imbalance causing this depression. But don't fret, we have this magic pill. Because life is too precious to go another day not feeling quite yourself. And I would see these commercials and I would think, well, maybe everybody has a chemical imbalance who is depressed. And indeed, one of the triumphs of psychiatrists is to find that magic pill, that powerful potion that will correct the imbalance. People everywhere, relief from these dark moments of sadness and hopelessness. But let me tell you, not all depression is a chemical imbalance. Yet depression is very real part of life for many people. You know, as a young minister, first couple of years I was called to the ministry, we had a revival at the church I was ministering. And at some point of the revival, we had an altar prayer and people would come down for prayer, specific prayer. So you had about 100 people. You had 10 ministers lining up and we're praying. We're taught that when somebody comes for prayer, you ask them specifically, what do you want me to pray about? Don't give me this blanket prayer. What are you dealing with? Do we want to pray for that right now? Afterwards, we would recap and we were talking and, and the response shocked me that, that out of the 100 people we were praying for, two out of three people said they're dealing with depression. I thought, the prayer would be more for physical need, a, a financial need, a, but so many depressed. I, I feel unworthy. I see no future. I have no hope. And I was outdone because guess what? These are church folk. Mm, okay. Let me repeat. Depression is a real issue. So if you hang in there with me for a little while, I'm going to see how God dealt with this issue of depression with his prophet Elijah, that we can glean some tools, some techniques, a plan when we find ourselves in that dark place of depression. From this text, we find that Elijah experienced many of the classic symptoms of clinical depression. Fear. He was on the run for his life. Suicidal tendencies. God, I just want to die right now. Excessive tiredness. Slept for two days. Feeling of rejection. It's like, Lord, I'm the only one that's on fire for you. I'm the only one left. And they're trying to kill me too. And he experienced this for a very long time. Nearly about two months in these few scriptures that have passed. And look, all of this occurred immediately following Elijah preaching one of the greatest sermons of his life, confront the false prophets on Mount Carmel, and because of his faith and obedience to God, God literally sent down fire to consume the sacrifice, and it began to rain on a land where there's been no rain for three years. And we think to ourselves, why would a man who had preached such an impressive message had experienced some of the most powerful displays of God right before his eyes? Why would he suddenly get gripped by fear, hopelessness, and despair? Why would he run to a desolate corner of the world and pray to die? Probably all kind of reasons. But the fact is, that's exactly what he did. And what this tells us that 
Even God's most dynamic servants can suffer with bouts of depression. It's not necessarily a, a mark of the lack of faith. It's not necessarily a, a mark of, of, of an immoral lifestyle. Elijah was the man of God in his day. None greater. And now we see he's so far down in the depths of despair that even looking up seems wrong to him. Hear me now. Depression is not a lack of faith. Depression is not a sin. It's not that I'm not trusting God. It's not a sign that I'm not saved. See, church folk need to stop beating up people and themselves with this broken theology that if you depress, then you ain't saved. If Elijah battled with depression, then I don't believe anyone is immune from depression darkening your doorstep. So here we are, Elijah praying to die, but that's not where God left him. See, that's, that's the good news for us today. Because that's not where God is going to leave us. Listen, when we find ourselves in a state of depression, it is not a test from God. Did you hear that? It is not a test from God to see if we have enough faith to pull ourselves up out of this situation. If you find yourself in a state of depression, remember this. God is for us, not against us. God is for us, not against us. God will not put more on us than we can bear, but the world will constantly try to do just that. The world is trying to break us as God is constantly healing, strengthening, and fortifying us. And let's be real this morning. I don't care how saved you are or think you are. The world and circumstances as we're fighting sometimes get some licks in. We could be up on our game and, and, and prayed up and studied up and we're swinging and swinging. All of a sudden, we find ourselves knocked on the ground. We looking back at our corner, and our corner man is like, I don't know where that came from, but you knocked out. And yes, we still know, laying on the ground, that God is able. Laying on the ground, we still know the miracles of God. We know God is everything. But laying on the ground right now, the loudest voice that I'm hearing is repossession and foreclosure and eviction and hunger and sickness in my body. I got a broken heart from this relationship. My kids not living up to their potential. My relative have died. I lost my job. I'm retired. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself right now. God, you're able, but right now, I just want this to stop. I'm overwhelmed. I want to feel better. I just want to die. Take me now, Lord. That's where we find Elijah the prophet this morning. And God didn't say, well, sorry, Elijah, you have a chemical imbalance. And... Zoloft and Lexapro, that's still a few thousand years away. Can't help you. Long before psychiatry was ever thought of, long before relief could be brought through little pills, long before we had clinics and psychiatrists and psychologists, not meaning any disrespect to those professions and the clinics that they run, but long before all of that 
God healed his man of depression and it was not an isolated incident. And what God did for Elijah, God can still do for you. Let's look at what God did in these few verses. See, God recognized that Elijah's depression was not an imaginary problem. It was real. It was tangible. You could cut it with a knife and God didn't say, Elijah, get a hold of yourself. It's a sinful attitude. Where is your faith, boy? Huh. See, that's where I used to be as a young minister until depression visited me. When someone was speaking to me about their feeling depressed, I, I, I just couldn't understand what they were talking about. My first reaction was, where is your faith, child of God? You, you, don't you know that God is able? Look at your blessings. And again, that's a big problem. Listen to me. When someone is dealing with depression, the last thing you need to do is to tell them to look, up, look at all the reasons they have not to be depressed. That ain't helpful at all. Um, you, you've heard it before. Look at where you live. You have health. You got a family and education. You got all this stuff. What you got to be depressed about? Let me help right now. God gave man dominion over all things. Dominion means rule and responsibility over everything. This means that things of the world will never ultimately fulfill us and stuff cannot heal us. Depression is a spiritual battle, and physical stuff will only divert, pacify, or temporarily medicate. But the reality of having stuff does not deliver us from depression. Because my retort was, Yes, I know people in third world countries are starving and I have food. That ain't helping right now. But look at what God did. In answer to Elijah's prayer to die, God just let him sleep. Sent angels to feed him. Let him sleep some more. And then God sends him out into the desert 40 days and 40 nights. And all that time, God didn't say a word. God didn't offer any counsel during this time. God didn't set Elijah down and have a face-to-face -face talk. And all this time, he just let him alone. Give him time to rest and think. I read a story about a, a woman whose son died in a fire. And she was home alone when she received a call to alert her that her son had died. Note to file. If that is a call that you must make, you need to make sure that person on the other end has somebody with them. Um, but alone she heard the news and something inside of her just snapped. And, and, and when her husband got home, he found her disoriented in a state of shock. And the next day, her other son was trying to have a conversation with her. And, and the only thing that she would say was, David dead? He would say, yes, mom, David's dead. And they talk about David for a little while, and her eyes would gloss over again. And, and then she'd go right back to it. Is David dead? Yes, mom, David dead. And again and again, and this would just repeat itself. And it's never easy to see someone you love experience that kind of brokenness. The doctor advised her husband, well, you need to put her in 
in a home, in a hospital for a while, but her husband says, no, if I do that, I'll never get her back. And for the next few days, he never left her side. He waited on her. He held her. He spoke kindly to her. No probing questions, no miracle pills, no nurses in white. Just rest and love. And in time, she, she recovered and dealt with her grief. In essence, that's just what God did for Elijah. No sermons, no long counseling sessions, just love and rest in this particular time. There, there is a thing, such a thing that I have praised, ministry of presence. Ministry of presence, where we need to just be present for and with someone who is going through a bout of depression. We're not in their life at that moment to fix them. Okay? And just allow them fellowship, rest, and love. But, you know, after this period of time, God now begins to deal with this depressed state. I got four things, short things, that God did to his, prom to his prophet to get him back on track. First, he sent him to church. Second, he, 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 he had Elijah tell him what the problem was. And third, God dealt with the false beliefs, the false ideas that were fueling the depression. And fourthly, God gave him something to do. Right? So let's take each one of these one at a time. His first rip, uh, cure for depression God sent him to church. God sent him to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, where God gave the law to Moses. The, the book of Hebrews, verses 10 and 25, says, do not, forsake, uh, do, do not forsake yourself the assembling of yourselves together, which implies that if we forsake coming together as a people of faith, there will be a void that exists in our life. You know, what I found out that church is one of the best places to deal with depression. When church is done right, hear me, it's a place where we listen to one another, help one another. In Galatians 6 and 2, it says we bear one another's burdens and to fulfill the law of Christ. It is a place where the saints come together to lift up the name of Jesus. A place where we are constantly reminded of the promises of God. A place where we hear testimony after testimony about God's deliverance. And we just say, wow, we serve an awesome God because look at what God is doing in his life, in her life, in this family's life. You see, depression is a spiritual battle. And church is a place where we're spiritually fed to be strong, to fight and overcome spiritual battles. This is why I encourage people to come to church on a regular basis. Not for just for themselves, but for somebody else in the pews that needs your hallelujah, that needs your testimony, that needs your display of faith. Man. When we are living life together as a faith community, we know when things occur in our lives. And when you see somebody at church and you know they just lost a relative, they may just lost their job, they're going through some things that making your problems seem very small. And when they can come in with their head held high and still lift up the name of Jesus, it does something to you. It's deliverance in the midst. It's like, wow. What? Hmm. You see, this is a spiritual hospital. Ain't nobody cured. Did you hear that? This is a spiritual hospital. Ain't nobody cured up in here. This is not just a place where we just come get dressed up and put on the front. There's no healing in that. The second thing that God did to heal Elijah's depression was to have Elijah tell him what the problem was. He asked Elijah, what, what, what are you doing here? He didn't ask this question just once. Same question two separate times. What are you doing here? Didn't God know? Of course God knew. 
he sent Elijah to this mountain. But Elijah needed to vocalize what was wrong in his life. He needed to explain what he thought the problem was. Many times in a depressed state, we, uh, people don't want to talk. They, they, they just don't want to talk about the problem. They talk around the problem. And we just hold it in. And the problem with holding it in is explosions do occur. We need to verbalize the problem to the Lord. Seek out a spiritual mentor, an elder. Talk to your pastor. We need to talk to somebody. If we talk to most people in the depressed state, the last thing they want to do is talk. Too painful to think about. No, it's too painful to keep it in. One day when I was a child and I was building go-kart and I smashed my thumb with a hammer and I looked and I could see blood forming under my thumbnail and if this has ever happened to you the pain is just excruciating I didn't know what I was going to do I, I was just like I couldn't even breathe the pain was so bad and I'm thinking I, I don't know what to do well I had a knife collection butterfly knives don't ask different kind of childhood I took one of those knives and I began to drill into my thumbnail. And as painful as that was, when the relief came and the blood shot out, I was like, oh my God, so much relief. Now think, I didn't want to drill a hole in my thumbnail, but the fact of the matter is I needed to go through that for the relief. You may not want to talk about it, but trust me, if it keeps building up and building up, somebody's going to get hurt. Once Elijah verbalized his belief of what was wrong, then the third thing, God dealt with those false beliefs, the false ideas that were fueling his depression. You know, Jesus says, the truth shall make you free. Why is that? Because false beliefs and false ideas, especially false ideas about God, have the power to put us in bondage. Our lives are built around what we think is true about life. And if the foundations of that reasoning are based on wrong information or impressions, the result can be devastating for us. Elijah's reply to God revealed that what Elijah really had wrong about his feelings. Elijah didn't think God was doing anything. In verse 14, Elijah says, look, I'm the only one that's been on fire for you, your, your people. They're not following your covenant. They tore down your altars. They, they've killed all the prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. See, hidden in the midst of that statement by Elijah is an accusation. I've been beating my head against the wall for you, God. Serving you. Everything in my life is falling apart. What have you been doing? It's your fault that I'm going through all of this. Because from my vantage point, you haven't been doing anything. And so God corrects Elijah's thinking. He said, you know what? You're not the only one left. I created this world, and as sinful as it is, there will always be a remnant who will serve me. The rocks cry out to me. Mm. But there are 7,000 still in Israel waiting on you to get back. As with us, we're never alone. God didn't create us to live alone and will always surround us with others who love God, who serve God, and who love us. At times, it seems like evil is winning, and we get frustrated. But God will always have a remnant. And remember this, God will never allow the good seed to be destroyed by the bad seed.
When a person is depressed, they don't think God is doing much of anything. No hope, no confidence, and, and God isn't easily seen by them. Because the problems and the stresses are too much. I can't see God, can't hear God. And a person with depression needs to realize, just like Elijah, that God is working in their lives even when they cannot see God. God is always for us and is never against us. Even in our darkest moments, God will show the light of his working it out for our good and to his glory. Amen? Amen. So God got Elijah to church. Got him to tell him what he thought the problem was. God corrected his false uh, thinking and lastly, God gave Elijah something to do. When he finished this counseling session on the mountain, Elijah was still sort of in a complaining mood. But God basically tells him, Now it's time to get back to work. I got a job for you to do. Make yourself useful. You have a purpose. That will not end in this state. You have a purpose that will not end in this cave. Go back to where you came. Anoint the two kings. And Elisha to be your successor. What God was telling Elijah is the same thing he's telling us. He says, I have work for you to do. And it will not end in the dark room of your house. It's not going to end in the dark room of your closet. In your basement. God is saying, lock up your house. Go across the tracks and find somebody in need and help that person to overcome this discouragement. Stop focusing so much on yourself and get involved in the lives of other people. Let me say this. It can be a real feel-good experience coming to church. It can. Even today as some are battling with depression right now. Coming and hearing the children and hearing this message over what I've been going through. I'm leaving feeling encouraged. And but I encourage you to, to you today to defeat this battle of depression. We've got to remain focused after the benediction. See, see, this, this, this service only points us in the right direction. We still got to walk it. So, so we got to remain focused after the benediction, after we walk out, after we hug next and, and tell everybody I'm glad to see you and we get back to our house and get back to work tomorrow and the rest of the week. We got to remain focused after the benediction. Let me ask you, what cave are you hanging out in this morning? Is it the cave of offense? Are you you're mad at God? Mad at somebody for what they did or didn't do to you or for you? And it's got you in a cave. Have you withdrawn because you're secretly angry? The cave of despondence. Are you just feeling numb? Isolated? From people, places. What is your cave this morning? Because I hear the voice of God saying, Cedric, why are you here? Why are you in this cave? While Elijah was in his cave, he heard the soft voice of God to come out of this cave of self pity. The events on the mountaintop with Elijah was a catalyst that brought him back to a connection with God. You see, like us, Elijah needed to be out of this cave in order to rediscover God. For that moment, see, depression causes us to lose God. God ain't went nowhere, but we sure have. He needed to learn that God was with him when things were going good. God is really right there when things are very tough. God doesn't always keep us.
from going through difficult times and difficult situations, but God promised to walk through them with us. See, hearing God's whisper reminded Elijah that, you know what? God is still in control of all these circumstances that are surrounding me right now. It, it's time this morning to emerge from our cave. It's time this morning to emerge from our caves. Even if you just got there. God is encouraging us to move out of our caves this morning. Be reminded today that, that, that God will always give us what we need when we need it. God, God gives us rest when we need it. God gives us love when we need it. God gives us conviction when we need it. Direction. Please look for God. Look for God's working in and through situations where we're feeling inadequate. When we're feeling alone, when we're feeling nobody cares, nobody's listening. I'm the only one left. God cares. God is listening. Listen, if God called you to this, God is with you in this. We have to believe that, that, that God is not going to leave us. Even if we find ourselves in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, God is right there. But be encouraged that even in this place, we are heading up the mountain of victory with a testimony, with a hallelujah that even in my darkest moments, you know what? God was there in my emotional breakdown that I had last week at work. It was God who wiped the tears from my eyes in my fit of rage when I was about to tear up everything. God gave me peace. When I was broken, God put me back together. When I felt alone that everybody had abandoned me, God gave me a church family and showed me that I am not the only one serving him. I'm not the only one faithful to him. I'm not the only one battling with depression. I have siblings who will stand with me, fight for me, pray with me, pray for me. So draw your strength today from the fact that when we're feeling down, God has not deserted us. God is with us in the wilderness. God is with us in our cave of doubt. God has work for us to do. And it's not accomplished in the cave. Our job right now is to remain focused after the benediction. Depression is real, but depression is not a death sentence. God wants to heal you everywhere you hurt this morning. Amen. Let us pray.